I'm a person that very, very seldom ever speaks on prophetic things. But I feel constrained tonight to do this. Maybe you won't agree with me. And I have learned a long time ago to get along with people that don't agree with me. <laughs> because God reserves the right to use people that don't agree with us. If you don't learn that, you're never going to go very far. Because God doesn't make us into a bunch of cookie cutters. Now, when I think of Valley Forge here, I think of those men that love this country, 11,000 of them to spend the winter over there and the wind blowing hills and cold. Many of them froze to death or starved to death. That place over there has been a great blessing to this world and a great blessing to this country. And it's often come to my mind that this place right here can be the same thing. If you were all in one accord as to what your main purpose is to get this world evangelized and keep your relationship with the Lord right. Otherwise, God, that's God's agenda for all of us. But the good thing about this place, you're with other people of likewise type of a faith. I've gone to church with people that didn't believe in giving the missions. And I've gone to church with those that didn't believe in giving much to missions. But I feel very much at home with you people because I was over 31 years old before I ever heard a word on getting the world evangelized been going to church most of my life. Well, if you did, there's some missionary come along dressed in his native guard and you had beads, blankets, and baskets. And that's what I usually put them in. I never learned anything from them, and they never seemed to take it from the Word of God why they were out there. And by the way, I'm convinced that about three out of every four evangelical Christian people have never heard real message on the Great Commission. I know I didn't. I never heard one until 1945 in the late fall. I will never forget it because I had just been converted a few months before that. And this fellow spoke on 1 Corinthians 15.34. This was his text. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Let us pray. Our Father, in Christ's name, we'd come to thee and ask thee to have your blessed spirit come to the side of each one of us here tonight and to shut out all truant thoughts and to think and be enlightened by him so that we might please thee more, that we might be in tune with your agenda and put our lives and our pocketbooks on the line. For your agenda, God, not our own agenda. God, help me to ever have my own agenda again. So, dear God, may your spirit speak through the word tonight in a mighty way. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as I say, I heard this man speak on awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, I tell you what you can do. You can go to almost any newsstand today and see pictures of women on there that have no shame. They have no shame. And I don't really think much of women that don't have much shame. Well, but how about these people that claim to be Christians that have no shame? About 200,000 people dying every day and going into hell without having heard the word of God or having heard that Christ loved them or the gospel. That doesn't bother them at, at all. Well, I can tell you it bothers me. And it bothers me to the tune where I do something about it. 
You know, he gave us this great job, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. And he doesn't intend to give us another 2,000, I can tell you that. And anybody that believes that those first century Christians believed that Jesus was coming any moment, they don't read the Bible very closely. And furthermore, if they did, they missed it over 1,900 years, and that's not even close in horseshoes. Now, I'm going to be talking to you tonight from what would be called in grammar prolepsis, prolepsis type of writing. And this is writing that Isaiah did. But I am going to quote you a verse, or four verses now, a prolepsis type of writing that Paul did. I have this in my new book under a chapter called that very important little word, the, T-H-E. But it should be pronounced the, where, when it is a definite article. See, in the Greek, they did not have a symbol for the, the general articles, like a and an, as you know, well know. Ah, but there was a symbol, and still around, for the definite article. Now, let me show you how important that is. I'm going to quote you now, 1 Corinthians 4. I want you to notice the difference between the word the and the. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some, some shall depart from the faith. The faith is a real faith. Anything less than that is a spurious faith. It's no longer the faith of the Bible. All right, now how are you going to tell them? Because, let me quote what I've already said. Now the Spirit, that's a capital S there in your Bible, for the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He's saying from the real faith. All right, now, here's going to be the characteristics of those churches that have departed from the faith. Now, you're going to see this is prolepsic type of a writing. That means writing about something in the future, but you're writing today as if you already know how it's going to be, and only the Spirit of God could give you that. Now, let me spell that word for you. You ought to write this down. You ought to, you ought to learn this word because... I'm going to show you quite a bit of it in the Bible tonight. It's spelled P-R-O-L-E-P-S-I-S. Prolepsis type of writing. Now, I've taken the, the definition of it out of American Heritage Dictionary, and here's what it says. An anachronistic representation of something existing before its proper or historical time as if you tell as if you would tell the cops a word like this if you tell the cops you're a dead man <laughs> right if you've done something terrible and the cops call you he says or some person if you tell the cops you're a dead man see that's in the present but he's telling what's going to happen to you in the future that's a prolepsic type of a remark. But this is prolepsic type of writing that Paul has done. All right, now I'm going to back up to that verse and we'll get to the main part of this in a moment. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now here's the characteristics of those that have have gone from the faith. It says, giving heed to see those spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hard iron, 
Now get this next phrase. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. Now let me quote the whole form together. See if you can tell me what church that's referring to primarily. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, a big period of time here, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. By the way, on TV now you can see all kinds of that late at night for you to send in your money if you're nice and stupid. And they'll tell your future, your fortune. <laughs> well, I can do it too, but it won't come true. But if it does, <laughs> but if it, if it does, it's the devil that did it. And a brother, you're bothering me, but you're talking over here. You. I, I know he, I know what he's trying to do, but I can't speak over that. <laughs> now, if you want to sit there in the back of the room, do it. That's okay, but. I can't, I can't stand the competition. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know, brother, you have a, a good heart and you're doing it for our brother, but you, it's either he gets it or they don't get it. <laughs> See what I mean? I can't do both at the same time, so pardon me for it. <laughs> oh, no. Then you have to watch me twice. <laughs> now, I don't think there is a reason in the world why this old world can't be blessed by just this group of people here and what God can do with you if you'll stick together and put your life into it like you have been in the past but only with more intense knowledge of the blessed scripture of what God is trying to do and that he needs your cooperation because God needs you and you need God. So, I'm saying this is Paul writing this. Now, getting back to this verse here. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, spike, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What, do you, what does that mean to you? It means your conscience doesn't work anymore. It's insensitive. I can take a a hot iron you women would use to press your clothes and put it right there and give me a third degree burn. And two years from now, you can come and stick pins in it and I wouldn't even feel it because it's burned out the nerves. It's insensitive. And that's the way your conscience will get if you keep listening to belly aching and people that never did anything and never going to do anything and let them move you. Oh, no, you better flee from such kind of people. And I, where I live, I don't even go around the belly acres because we got enough of that. And all we need, and let me tell you, God doesn't need a thousand people to get this world evangelized. If he can get three or four hundred that understand what he wants done and they're willing to put their life on the line to do it and make it available or do it themselves, but stand behind because in a, any good war, for every man fighting at the front, there's 18 men behind them, proceeding and, and providing articles of war, such as the weapons, the food, the clothing, all of the great logistics and statistics. It's, there has to be 18 back here for one out there on the front line. And the same thing is true in the Church of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, the guy that stays for the stuff is going to going to partake of the, of the blessing from this as much as the guy that goes out there to battle. And you'll find as many people trying to get you away from getting in the battle for the Lord to get this world evangelized as there was during the Vietnam War when all these people were back here <sighs> knocking the war. And I'm going to tell you something. I could give you a one-hour lecture showing you that there never was a war that the United States was in where they were so right as they were in the Vietnam War. Yet you never heard that statement ever made before, but I, I could back it up. And one time I was speaking at a very heavy conference, 
during that war, and I, I shared the platform with General Van Orman, who was the head of all maintenance. I don't mean maintenance, but I mean ordnance, if you know what that is, the weaponry for our Air Force in that law, in that war, Vietnam War. He heard me speak first. He heard me give my testimony for Christ. And then I got in the meat of my lectures. And there was a coffee uh, break after mine, and then he went, but he got me aside, and he said, Con, would you give me a theological interpretation of this war? I said, I sure will. And it took me about 10 minutes to do it. And when I finished, he said, that's the only answer to this war I've ever heard. It makes any sense to me. Makes any sense to me, but he said, I agree with you 100% on what you said. I just wish they knew that at West Point, and they knew it in our war college down there in Kalio, and they knew it down there in the White House, what you have said. So once in a while, the Spirit of God does get something true to me, and I think tonight you might like what I'm going to say to you. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, it wasn't until almost the end of the ninth century before they stopped allowing their preachers to marry. They, they were getting married that long a time. It wasn't until the 13th century, 1255 to be exact, where they commanded people to stop eating meat on Friday. Now, what feeling should a Catholic have Roman Catholic, when he sees this prolipsy writing in here, and who is pointing toward, what should he do? He better get off a sinking ship. He better get off of it, because there's coming a time in the book of Revelation when she's called the Red Whore, or the book of Revelation, there's coming a time in there when God says, get out of her, my people, which does mean there's a few people in there that are saved. Some people in there to say, but he's there's coming a day he's going to tell each and every one of them get out. Only then it's going to be a command. It's going to be a command and a demand. All right, now by the same token, maybe you didn't even know what I meant when I read. And I said it's anachronistic. Well, I wrote down here a definition of that just so in case. You didn't know. And it, it's simply something that said that it's out of proper chronologic order. Otherwise, it's written before it happens. But it happens. Now, he isn't saying who's going to say it, who's going to do it, and no particular individuals in case, so you can't say some predestined to do that and some aren't. No. That'll be decided then. Now, let me read this to you. Here's a part of now toward the future. Here's some prolific type of writing. And by the way, you sit down and you read the book of Isaiah and you're going to be amazed at how much of this there is in this book. Now listen to this. This is Isaiah 54. I'm reading the first two verses. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, Bring forth unto singing and cry aloud, thou that did not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now this is a text which I have known what that means. I've known, I think I could safely say, over 40 years. Over 40 years. Now, I'm sure you're going to have to do some thinking for it to ever come through to you. What does it mean? Spare not, lengthen thy cord, and strengthen thy stakes. Well, how do you put a tent up? First, you've got to have poles. But what do you got to have poles to keep them up there unless you're driving a stake here? I'm driving one that's holding the building up here, or holding the tent up. And you have a cord coming down this way, then one coming this way, but you better have them this way also. 
for no matter which way the wind would come from. Now this thing right here, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, simply means this, that God wants to increase your sphere of Christian influence in this world in a great and a mighty way. That it might be a thousands of times what it is right now. That you personally, you personally, says he wants to lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. Well, that's talking about a bigger tent. A bigger thing to operate under. Now, I think that if you take a, a good circus, is like any good company. Most good companies are run by three or four people. They're the guys that will knock themselves out for it. My daughters used to say to me, Daddy, why do you go to work on, sa on Saturday and all the other daddies on the street here? They don't go to work on Sunday. Well, I said, none of those are presidents either. <laughs> they weren't. And none of them ever got to be president. Because to be a president is not no nine-to-five job. And to run a big organization for God is not a nine-to-five job. If you want that kind, you're in the wrong kind of business. So he doesn't have that kind. And I said, by the way, do you want to go to college when you grow up? Oh, yes, Daddy. We want to go to college. Well, I said, these other kids along here, do you think they're going to go to college? Well, we don't know, Daddy. I said, well, I don't know either, but I can give you a pretty good guess on some of them. And my kids went to college. Both of them drove a car when they went to college. And they didn't have to work 40 hours a week like I had to. Pay my own room and board and then go to school and go to sleep in class because I was exhausted. I did that many a time and dropped books. I <laughs> dropped tens on the floor. But I wanted an education so bad. And later then when I became a Christian, then I wanted it all the more. So I'd be, whatever I did was good for the Lord. And he could use it in a mighty way. Now, it's, it's just as easy in this life to be diligent as it is to be dilatory. But you go to sleep when you're diligent. And the dilatory ones, they've got to drink themselves to sleep. Now, I think being called by God to be in his army and to be concerned and enlightened about what he wants out of me and out of my life, I think that's one of the greatest blessings I've ever had that you can ever have, too. That you're a man and God is teaching you and he's got your ear and he's going to pour into you his knowledge and his so that you can work for him and his work will be done well through you. I can't think of a, anything I want for my son any more than that. Sure, my son's got a big job, but also he's been the chairman of his church and he's very diligent at it. And I think he's a real, thoroughly saved man. He's got four girls on their way to heaven, living godly lives. Well, that doesn't come easy, friends, in our day. But it's because he's diligent. Well, now, this great job that we have, and listen to this. I'm saying this to all you people here. Here's what God wants you to do. He wants to strengthen thy cords. Otherwise, give you greater influence in this world of missions and helping the poor and the sick and uh, anyone else that you can help. Then to lengthen your cords, which means to keep you right where it is, keep you steady for him. I think he wants to do that. If you're, if you're the kind of people of faith that I think you are, I think you're going to do that. But let me tell you something. He may be doing here what he did with Mr. Gideon. Mr. Gideon is the only fellow in the whole country where the Israelites is working. They'd been used to planting their crops, and Midianites come up, take their crops, and burn them up, and they'd sit back and suck their thumb and wash them. And then after that, they'd say, oh, why go out and plant? They're going to come burn down and take them down. And here was Gideon, the only guy in the whole country working. He's got a big old sigh out there, and he's, he's cutting it down. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the one man that was working. To the one man. 
He never uses lazy people. He says, Gideon, though, thy mighty man of valor. I can see Gideon looking around saying, who are you talking to me? I ain't no mighty valor. Must be somebody else here. Thy mighty man of valor. He says, yes. Yeah. The Lord is with thee. Well, if he is, Gideon had a great question. And one of the greatest questions you know about. If the Lord be with me, then where be all the miracles? Now I ask you the same thing. If the Lord be with you, then where be all the miracles? I don't know about you, but I had jobs for years. I needed miracles every day. Because I used to get 120 problems in the mail every week. And they weren't the kind of questions that Mr. Anthony got. My husband doesn't appreciate me. What must I do? No, no. <laughs> These were tough problems. And if I hadn't known of the Lord in a very intimate, conscious relationship, I wouldn't even dare to take that job. I really wouldn't have. Because I need him every hour of every day. I'll give you an example. We had a big problem for, for Howard Hughes. He had lots of money, but he had just as much guts as he did money. And this was, we weren't getting the job done. And this was a real big problem that his company had. And we were working on it with a company out of Toledo. They had started on it, hadn't gotten it done, now it's turned over to us. And we must have had it over two months. And up comes the big financial man. And he gets the president of our company and talks to him about this problem. What are you doing about it? Well, the president, he, he said, well, well, let's go up and see the chief engineer. We'll see what he's doing about it. He really didn't know. That's why he's coming to me. <laughs> and maybe it's my fault. I wasn't reporting close enough, but I was just so busy in getting things done. You can sit around making out reports all day long and not get anything done, you know. So they came out to my office. He introduced me. John. He said, Mr. Khan, you got this problem for us. What are you doing? I said, well, you see that fellow through the glass door over there? His name is Aldo Tonietti. He's the top engineer in the world on this kind of problem. I've had him on it for two or three weeks. He didn't get very far, and I have another assistant chief engineer over here. He's got about 70 men working for him, as good as there is in the whole world. His name was Al Drantz. And I said, uh, he's been working on it now for two, for two weeks. He hasn't got it solved either. He said, well, let's go see him. Well, we went down. We went to see them. Now, listen, the muck and stuff is that deep. And there's no place for guys that's wearing floor shine shoes. <laughs> and he says, all right, now tell me what's got you stumped. Well, Drance, he looked at me, who's this guy? I never even said. I said, Al, they want to know where you've gotten and bring your dad out here and let us see it. So we looked at it about five minutes and they didn't understand what they were looking at anyway. And I said, now, did you fellows pardon me for just a moment? And I got Al aside, and I put my arm around him on his shoulder. And I said, Al, you've been doing a terrific job. I want to thank you for it. But now, you just leave the figures here, and I'll take it from here. I'll take it from here. And here he is. He's got his pants rolled up like this, and he's looking. He's all dirty. I said, it's okay, uh, you know, I came up the hard way. I can, I, I, I'll just leave it to me, Alan. Thanks very much. See you later. So he goes back up to his nice office and nice job. So I said to them, I said, now, Dale, I said, Dale, I'm going to take over now. I can see that's what you want. That guy said, you bet your life it's what you want. I want you. I'm at the end of the line here with you. I, I want it. I want this thing. 
so there's no problems with it anymore and works every time. It didn't ha work, hardly work at all. <laughs> so I just took this data and I just sat there like this and I'm looking at it for a while and they walked away. In about a half an hour, they came back and I got my pants legs rolled up. And this is about a year, or about a two or three months before Francis and I got married. That would have made it in 1952. And they, they stand up here, but they're above me. Well, Harry, how are you doing? Well, he didn't know it. Half of that time I spent praying. I said, Dale, you fellas don't need to worry about this job. I'm not working for you. I'm working for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to get it solved. And he'll get the honor, and he'll get the glory from it. No, I can't get it solved talking to you. And I said, don't worry, Dale. He said, okay, Harry. And he walked away. And I got in on this and got to analyzing this data. And uh, I'll tell you, it wasn't five minutes that blessed the Spirit of God gave me the answer. I didn't have any of the machine removed or anything. I, I had the buttons and all that. But I saw of some things that they had left out. Of. And the Spirit of God seemed to point it out to me just like it. If you had a white tablecloth here and you took an overripe tomato <laughs> and you threw it like that, you'd know where it landed. That's the way that thing just jumped up and about bit me. And so then I dialed all this stuff in. Man, it worked, worked perfect. Worked perfect. What do you think I said? Praise the Lord. And I don't care who heard it. Praise the Lord. And so... They were up in my office, which was a lot closer than the president's office. I wiped the stuff off of my shoes, got them clean, and I walked up there. They said, well, did you get it? I said, yeah. I didn't, but the Lord showed me how. The Lord showed me how to do it, where, where we were wrong. You see, all things are made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's Jesus, in case you didn't know it. That's John 1, 3. Because I'd been down there praying, now, Lord, all things are made by thee, and without thee was not anything made that was made. And I know this is just like eating chicken to you. <laughs> and dear Lord, would you help this poor old wooden-headed engineer? Here I am again. Would you help me? And I'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. See, God never gives us a job to do, but what he'll enable us to do it if we'll work. And have our attitude and disposition of heart right. He'll do it. Because he wants to bring glory to our Heavenly Father too. You know what it means to, to bring glory to him? Here's what it means. Because glory means a manifested excellency. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. They're showing the excellency of God. Because you know a person when you see what they make, right? When you look at all the heavens up there, Oh, and everything is up there. And if you know anything about astronomy, all you can do is bow your head and think that the good Lord, there is such a God as him. But I thank him also that his ear is open to little guys like you and me. Now, when we come to him and we want to work about his problems that he has down here, don't you think if we'll really study? Where's Buddy tonight? Where is he? I'll break his leg when I see him. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've given him something to read. You know, there's some people in this world, they'll do anything but read a book. I know of a fellow who's president of a, our denominational seminary, and I went on a commencement at and it was just about over, he'd say to these graduates, now would you please in the next 10 years read a book? <laughs> well, you don't know, this guy's come out for a nice cushy job. They don't want to go leave their studying too. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Leaders are readers. There's a lot of readers that aren't leaders, but there's no leaders that aren't readers. 
And if you're a guy that's got to be in bed by 10 o'clock every night, I'd advise you to get out of the ministry. I would do. I would do that. If you're a guy that's got to be that, you're a mama's boy, and you've got to be in bed with mama at 10 o'clock, you show me any soldiers that go to war like that. And I'll tell you, I cannot have men that work for me like that. And listen, this job of getting the world evangelized is the most important job in this world, but that's where we need to have our mind in tune with the Holy Spirit of God to show us where we've been missing the boat and what we ought to be doing about it. Then when we get enlightened, he is going to answer our prayers. Not unless he's convinced that we are in this with our whole soul and body and mind and we have put God's agenda first. If we do that, you have no idea what God can do with your life. You have no idea whatsoever. I tell you, I have made my living off of real, real, real tough problems. Like for instance, I was at Ronald Reagan's house for dinner, 1969. I sat down beside a man that I had known since 1946, but we hadn't seen each other for 20 years. He's one of Billy Graham's best friends. Hello, Harry, how are you? Well, Walt, I said, Lord bless you, brother. I'll tell you, we didn't hear much went on in that house that night. We talked about the Lord most of the time. He just got back from China, and he's telling me all about it. <laughs> and he says to me, Harry, do you get to Florida very often? I said, well, I paid for 35 trips for my wife and kids to go down there. I didn't always go because I had to work many times because my wife's folks lived in Englewood. He said, but do you get down there? I said, yes, I lecture every winter down at University of South Florida in Tampa. He said, well, the next time you come, would you come to our company? Would you help us? Would you go through the plant? Would you tell me what you can do for us? I said, I sure will, Walt, I owe you one. Well, I got so busy, I forgot about that winter. And I did the next winter also. But when it came to year 83 or 82, I said, well, Francis, we're going to Tampa again. Then we're going to go over and see Walt Maloon in Orlando, after it's over. Well, the last day in my lecture, a man came to me, one of the top guys, one of the biggest steel companies. He said, Con, would you come over to our plant in Orlando? We've got four terrible big problems we're not getting the first base on. Would you come over and tackle these problems for us? I said, I sure will. You've been a wonderful customer of ours, and I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to serve you. So I took my wife to this retired professor and his wife. She was there, and I went on out to this company. I met this fella, and by 10.30, I was out there. He, man, I thought that guy would kiss me, and I didn't want to... <laughs> <laughs> He said, man, we've had these problems so long, and here we are, you and I are all done but 10.30 in the morning, uh, and everything's hunky-dory. I said, well, you should know the Lord I know, brother. <laughs> he said, nobody around here had a clue on any of those. I said, okay, okay. So she and I went on over to, to Orlando. I mean, from where we were, was way up in the north side, and went and met this fellow, the president of this, big boat company. We had lunch with him. And he said, well, Harry, would you come out tomorrow morning, and go through our plant with me and, or with my son, and then come back in and see me? I said, sure. So I went out. The next day, went through the plant, and they were walking me bow-legged. <laughs> and finally, they took me back over to, his over to his office, the president. He said, well, Harry, what can you do for me? I said, wait a minute, Walt, I don't shoot from the hip like that. 
I said, what I want from you, I want your financial figures. I want your balance sheet, and I want your earnings statement for each of the last five years, and I want it up to the end of last month. He said, okay, okay. You give it to me, and I'll fly home, and then I'll come back here two weeks from now, I mean 10 days from now, and I'll tell you what I can do. I'm going to study this thing. You've had this problem now since 1959. <laughs> he wants me to answer it now in five minutes. So they gave me these financials, five years, and I took them home. And I had one of the best financial men in the whole world that was our vice president of finance. I gave him a set, and I said, in a couple of days, that's you and I talk about him, Harley. He said, okay. In a couple of days, we got together, and he gave me some of his ideas, and I took a few of the ideas the Lord had given me. I put them together, and I flew down to Orlando, bought my own tickets. They would have taken care of it. But I tell you, I owed him one. I owed him a favor, because For 30 years before, I'd only been saved two years, I agreed to buy a, a boat for Jack Wurtzen's camp of Scroon Lake. Now that big island up there, they didn't have any way to get over there. And so he came to me, he said, Harry, can you help me? I said, yeah. I said, you call up Walt Malone, down in, you know him, down in Orlando. You tell him what you need in the way of a boat. And I said, here's 300 bucks down and tell him to make it for you. So he did. But Jack sure took advantage of me. Man, the size of that boat. <laughs> Ooh, man, I thought it was a Queen Mary when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> when I finally did see it, I was out of a job. And furthermore, when I told him to do that, I had twice as much money in the bank as it would have taken to pay for it, but my brother borrowed it from me and he died before he could pay it back. And here they, they called me up, this big <laughs> boat's up here. Now have you got the money to pay for it? I said, nope, I haven't got a dime. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better know the Lord in a case like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, I said, you tell Mr. Maloon, WC, I'll pay for it. I can't do it right now, but just as sure as he's sitting there, this Scotsman, never beat anyone out of a dime in his life, and if I ever went bankrupt, I'd pay everybody back anyway, because when you go bankrupt, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pay him. If it takes you the rest of your life. The only reason for bankruptcy is to get the heat off you, all these guys trying to, to twist the money out of you when you don't have it and to give you a peace of mind so you can get it straightened out. But that doesn't mean that you're not to pay those bills. Yes, sir, you certainly are. Well, I looked at these figures and I went down, back down there and I sat in this big room, a board meeting room, similar to yours here that you have. Well, here's a little short guy, he's the chairman of the board and his brother, who was the president, sat beside him, and then there was myself, and then there was a vice president of manufacturing, an executive vice president, vice president of finance, and vice president of marketing. Well, Harry, what can you do for us? What do you think? I said, well, gentlemen, I've looked over statements like this for about 800 firms, and this is the worst I ever saw in my life. Oh, that guy, if he'd have been a Roman candle, he'd have hit Mars in three minutes. <laughs> Was he hot? Oh, if he hadn't been a Christian gentleman, he'd have whacked me right in the kisser. That's how mad he was. I could have taken a match and put it on his face. And <laughs> was he mad? Well, he says, what's so bad about it? I said, your cost of goods is horrendous. It's terrible. I've never seen one this bad in my whole life. He said, well, you know that's the national average of our industry? I said, now, Ralph, you ought to know because they're a bunch of idiots that doesn't give you the right to be an idiot. If that's how dumb your competitors are, boy, you've got to wait till I get this thing straightened out. You're going to have a gravy train. Was he mad? He doesn't like me yet. 
Well, lots of people don't like me. That's all right. That's all right, because when you call a spade a spade, brother, you're not going to have any metals pinned on you. But I said, look, I know how to turn this around. I know how to turn it around very quick. Well, what's it going to cost you? I said, nothing for me, because I owe you guys one. You're very, very gracious to me. You never said one word the whole time I was paying off that boat. And I didn't marry Francis for two years because I didn't have a boat paid off. I'd already been working on it three years then. <laughs> <laughs> and I was riding a streetcar. I didn't have no car. My mother would say to me, Harry, all the neighbors know you've got a big job, but you don't even have a car. <laughs> Why do you live like that? I said, Mama, you're the one that taught me how to live like that. The way you gave everything you had to Jesus. You helped all the poor, all the sick. I'm just living the way you taught me to live, Mama. <laughs> she left me alone. <laughs> I'll tell you, when I, bet, when I told them what to do, I said, here's one place I can save you $664,000 like that. I said, how, what will it cost us? I said, about $8,000, but not with me. That's all it costs you. Would you spend $8,000 to save 664000 Yes, you sure would, even if you'd been in the third grade four years, you'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> so they made out the financial for the, by the way, they also they made over $800,000 and they lost a bundle a year before I went to West Point. My first year with them, saved them. Just one thing, 600000 but they made that. They had never made that much since 1925. That's quite a rut. <laughs> <laughs> and then they made out their financial plan for the next year, and they sent it to me. I said, well, I can't agree with this. They said, why? I said, you got $70,000 a year you're going to give to missionaries this, this coming year. And you haven't paid off all the people that you went bankrupt and you got 124 companies that you owe money to and that's not your money to give. Now, there ain't no man in this world can ever say it. I don't believe in giving the mission. Nobody. But I said, God doesn't want that kind of man, that kind of money. He wants you to, he says, owe no man anything. Don't you fellows read your Bible? Every one of them on Christian boards. Every one of them. And I just, I peeled the hide off those guys, I'll tell you. Because if we Christians don't pay our bills, who are you going to trust in this world? And besides, it'll develop character in you. I'm preaching to them like, like they're in the third grade. And I think morally they were. Well, I said, I'm, forg I'm forgiven $70,000 to missionaries but not if it belongs to somebody else and somebody's waited all this time. So you know what they did that year? They paid off every one of those 124 people and the first guy they called in said, now would you please come in? We owe you $8,000. He came in and his wife pushing him in a wheelchair. He about as old, a couple years older than me and just about as decrepit as me. And he's in this wheelchair, and they said to him, now, we, we're sorry. We've taken all this time to pay you this $8,000, but here's the check. And the guy looked at him and began to cry. He sobbed. He was stone broke. Stone broke. Just sat there and sobbed. So this old chairman of the board said to his wife, he says, could I talk to you outside the room here a moment? He said, yes, why not? He said, ma'am, you look like a Christian. Are you a Christian? She said, I sure am. I love Jesus with all my heart. Well, is your husband a Christian? Oh, no, <laughs> he sure is. Well, you wouldn't mind if I talked to him about the Lord? She said, oh, no, please do. So these fellows gathered around him, and they led him to Christ that afternoon. They took hours to do it. None of this except Jesus stuff, you know, like, like most people. They're really laying on the line. Out of, we could, there's three companies that couldn't find. 
You should have seen the letters that they got from people. We didn't know there's people like this anymore with this kind of veracity and with this kind of truth. And this way, take their, that's so serious. You cannot believe all the letters and the nice things that those people said. And you know what? That year they made over a million bucks. Never had made a million bucks. And paid them all back at the same time. And was I glad? I said, you're not going to give that. If you do, I won't work. I won't be a consultant to you. I won't be on a board. I won't be nothing. If you, if you don't take care of these debts first. Don't you think I was right saying that? Well, they weren't very, very happy customers and feeling about me, but that didn't have a thing to do with it. Because what is right, my friends, is right. And we've got to stand for what's right. Not just stand for it when we go to church, but out there in the battle line where, where the tempers get pretty... And I'll tell you, those people knew that I meant business because they could remember when I was sending money every week. And they knew I wasn't... I'm riding an old Chicago $25,000 car, city bus. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all in the way you look at it, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's your attitude toward it. Now, if we will mean that kind of business and get in this world evangelized and put him first and the heathens out there second and do everything we can and ask God to give us the wherewithal to do this, he's not broke. He's not broke at all. I was just telling Brother Russ this morning. I said, Russ, pray for me. I said, I, I work very close to two, two guys. One of them's perhaps the richest guy in the state of Illinois, and the other guy, he's only probably worth about 60 million. And he just got saved a year ago. The guy's my boss. But I'm having trouble with my book because for 10 years I just was writing stuff on science and technology, and I got it out of the Christian publishing company, and they forgot about me. And a man called me two years ago and said, Harriet, when are you going to write again? I'd like to publish it. He, yeah, a good company. I said, oh, I'm working on something now. This book that I've finished, I've been on three and a half years. It's called Grace or Disgrace. The next time I speak here, I'm going to give you one of the chapters of it. You're going to see why I think God wants this thing published. But God is limited to your hands and my hands. But there's no limit to what he can do with those hands in our pocketbook when it's put down to his disposal and where he can't lead us and where he can lead us. Like for instance, I told my wife the other night when I lay in bed and boy when I went to college I wasn't no honor roll student. I was never an honor roll student anywhere unless I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was a Christian I stopped that. So no more honor roll. <laughs> <laughs> no more dean's list any of that kind of stuff. But the Lord knew why I was studying. He knew why I was studying. I said, well, Jesus, if I'm going to be a chief engineer for you, I want to be the very best it's possible for you to be so I can witness to as many men as I can. Now, those guys that went to school with me, they would have flipped their lid and seen some of the meetings that I had. Here's just one of them. They give me 96 of the top, of the top research directors in this country. One whole morning at the greatest engineering convention in Cobo Hall, and I start out the way with the saving grace of Jesus. And I tell them, I'm no genius. No, I know something about what I'm doing, or they wouldn't have asked me to come and speak. But my main claim to, to fame is, and the good sense is, one night in New York City, I got down alongside of a hotel rep bed. I confessed my sins to Jesus. Ask him to forgive me and to help me to overcome them. Would he save my poor, miserable, sinful, selfish soul? And he did it. By the way, you should have seen how many of those men came up to me afterward and wanted to talk about Jesus. Out of the 96 top research directors in this whole country. Well, when I was going to school, I'd been scared to death to even go to the meeting with those guys. But here, God put me on that kind of plane 
And I gave talks in 265 cities in the United States and Canada and Mexico doing that kind of work. Don't you think God cared about those guys too? Of course. Well, they cannot say they didn't hear the gospel from Harry Kahn. And I got letters from quite a few of them say, oh, Harry, I heard you when I got back to Worcester, Massachusetts. I've been going to church with my wife when she'd get me by the year. And then I'd hear them give an invitation. I said, I'm never going to walk down Nile like that. No, no, no. I've had a lot of guys say that. If you're too proud to do that, then God's not going to save you. I've had them write to me and say, Harry, I went to church with my wife the next Sunday after I heard you. I said, if Harry Kahn can do that in front of the greatest brains we got, I ought to be able to do it with this bunch of dummies. <laughs> And he said, I got up and I went down that aisle. And he says, I got saved at that altar. And I stayed there till I was saved. And I've been teaching Sunday school now for a year and a half. Don't you think it was worth it? Listen, I haven't done a thing that you guys, every one of you in this room, can't make me look like I've done nothing. These last days, very perilous days and God needs real men that will study and know what all the boners that we've done in foreign missions all the stupid things that we've done and read them and say well God we will not repeat those errors there's nothing wrong with making a mistake but it's wrong when you may get twice in a row and there's some of the greatest stuff ever been written on missions that 95% of the missionaries never read I gave Buddy one of them last night alone for him to read. Boy, when you read that thing, it just makes you sick. And when you've been on as many fields as I've been on and spoken to them, and the things that I saw and the things that I heard a man telling me, he said, oh, we pray for a revival here, but we beat our wives at night. And there's missionaries' wives going around here with black eyes. I say, you better go home and get saved, brother. Now, my wife's had me kicked a couple times in 44 years, but it's never, never entered my, my mind that I would raise my hand or that I would want to divorce her or anything like that because I married her for life. And I wanted to be gentle and I wanted to be tender to him and every other woman in this world because my dad was not a gentle, tender person. And I thought my mama had that coming. I said, oh, God, if I ever get married, I'm going to be gentle and tender to them, regardless of whether they <laughs> should be or not. And I think that's a pretty good thing to have in a man's mind. Because what a wonderful, wonderful mother I had. I never once heard my dad ever say he loved her. Never heard it. And he was a good dad to me, don't get me wrong. A good, wonderful dad to me. Now, what I'm trying to say to you here is he's, he's willing to lengthen our cord. He's willing to make this place so big that the other big mission boards would be jealous. But if they get to know you, they won't be jealous because you, you're only out to help them. It's hard to get mad at a person that helps you and who doesn't want anything in return for it. And I was... I was thinking about this uh, that this afternoon up there in my bed. I was sitting on it. Oh, God, where's this effect? I'm a pretty good guy of vision, but I can, cannot envision the good that could come to this world on account of these people here at National Christian Conference Center if they all get a hold of this thing and get behind Russ and push and push and put everything in it you got. And let me tell you something. I've seen the time many times when I didn't have five dollars to my s since I got my missionary vision back there in the fall of '45. But there was never one time that I was ashamed of that, or I didn't get to where I was going when I should get there, and, and I didn't beg money or anything. Like I said to uh, over in Hawaii here recently. If you don't have enough faith to tithe on, please don't try dying on. 
You get that? If you don't have enough faith that you can live and give God his 10%, then don't try dying on it. No, no, you won't make it. You won't make it. Many times I've, I've sat there and I've looked at money in my hands, and all I had was car fare to get to work. I thank God. I looked at it and said, Lord, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? I kind of grinned. I guess he must have too. <laughs> I'd go get in the bus, give him the last quarter. And after making a transfer, I'd get there and walk a quarter of a mile after I got off down the coldest wind tunnel you ever saw in your life. And go up and sit down and walk right through that beautiful cafeteria we had in our company. And about a block up to my office in the same building. Sit down within an hour, here comes the president. Harry, you heard of Pratt and Whitney? Yeah, I did a lot of work there in World War II. Out there, my guys don't like because he talks to them about Jesus. <laughs> but they say the guy knows what he's doing. And they say he can, he can handle this if you give him a chance. He'd say, Harry, would you go out to see how, uh, our accountant and get $300 expense money and go out there and take care of that? I'd say, let me think it over, Dale. That's long enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I go and get my three hundred dollars, then go get my breakfast, <laughs> <laughs> then go to the airport and pick up my ticket they had waiting for me. And when I got there, they come marching me down through the shop. These six guys with coats on, they look like I'm nuts, and they're herding me off to the funny farm. See, <laughs> all white coats, all these guys from research. I'm walking down there in my just ordinary suit. I get there in five minutes. I got all that. I said, let's go home. There it is. <laughs> he want to eat them other guys, you know. We get that guy all the way out here. We've had him here from England. We've had him here from California. And this holy roller comes in here and he gets <laughs> in five minutes. I didn't. The Lord did. Mm-hmm. Listen, you don't know what God can do to people that are sold out to him 100% and want to glorify him and everything in their life. And want to want every man in the world to have a chance to hear the blessed gospel of well, Lord Jesus Christ. I think Jesus has got a right to get what he died for. And he died for every man in this world. And everything I have in this world, I'm going to put it at his disposal. And I'll tell you, the more you do that, the more they'll be at your disposal. Because I figured out how to do this afternoon, what you and I were talking about this morning. You know what I mean. Uh, There's nothing, I was no better student than any of you fellows in this room. No better student. Now, I have a lot more to go, but here I've been talking long, too long now. So, maybe I'll get back on this on Thursday night, and maybe I'll take a chapter out of my book. And you'll see whether you want to read my book or not, because there's some places it's going to curl your hair. <laughs> well, I want to buy, when I read a book, I want it to challenge me, don't you? Amen. If you got a challenge for me, I'm, I'm remiss if I don't listen to it. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but you ought to listen. Brother, would you dismiss us?